Okay, um, so for today's discussion, we'll discuss the remaining sections of chapter one. So we'll start with the 1.3, which is running and stopping the app. So the last time we had created a very simple app, um, just having Hello Cohort 3. So today we will build on to that. We'll add some UI, then follow up, we'll add server and run. And lastly, run, learn about um, the reactive expressions. So uh, please note, I'm using the whole cohort two uh, cause notes, sorry, <laughs> the notes that they, they made, uh, but I've added some of the things that I, I didn't understand. So in my own understanding, the basic workflow of a shiny app development is first of all, we write some code and then we run, we run the app or rather touch the app. We can play with the app and write some more code and then we repeat the entire process. So that has been shown in this diagram where you write some code and then you start the app, then you play and test the app and then you stop the app and then you can write some other code, the process continues. So in running your app, we can use two ways depending on if you're working using a studio or if you're not. So if you're using a studio, you click the run app button, you will see that. And, um, or use the keyboard control, which is either the command a stroke plus, oh, sorry, I, well, I understood control shift enter. I, I think for the Mac, it's mm -hmm. command shift enter. I am not sure about that. Uh, yes. Um, and then if you're not using our studio, you can run the code source um, and the whole document, it's, sorry, like you run source of the entire document or you call shiny uh, this particular R chunk. So yeah, this, the run up function. Uh, let's see that. So here we see our working from our studio. So you can see this, this the run up button. And if I click it, so I'm not sure because <laughs> I've had two. So let me not click that. But you can either do that or you can do this. The running that it runs this particular code, the, uh, the simple app that we build on to having this. So we'll see about that. Okay, so I remember um, run admission from last week's discussion about this particular number. So we had this one. To seven to so this number and this. So what we see here is we see that this the one twenty seven. It's a standard address for the particular computer for this particular computer and the last four digits. In my case, is different from here. This is a randomly assigned port number. And I note that while you are running a shiny app, this keeps R busy and will not be able to execute any other command in the console at that particular time. So we have our, uh, sorry, yes, Ryan. I was gonna, I was gonna come back and add. So 127001, that's called a loopback. And it, by default, all, well, the majority of common computers will always use that loopback as pointing back at itself. So the, the concept is that when you generate your web server, right, you have this interactive uh, exchange between a browser and the, and the actual machine itself. 127.001 is a network address that points back at the machine. So when you open your browser and you're interacting with it, all you're doing is just communicating back, but you're using an HTML form or an HTTP form protocol to exchange that data. The port identification, there can be 65, thousand and some change 65,526 or something um, port uh, assignments on any machine so <clears throat> when it commented that this is a random assignment it's literally just random it'll just throw out you know some five uh, five digit number out there uh, as long as it's not being applied or used by another service on your machine if that makes sense so the comment I was making from last week was you can have multiple, web servers, uh, whether it be, you know, Python oriented, Node.js or some other Ruby uh, type web server, R is going to spin up and assign that 
particular port, what you want to be careful of is if you happen to assign the same port, the computer is not going to know what service it's going to be communicating with. So it must be unique that uh, port assignment is. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ren, for the comments. So how do we stop an app? There are three ways that you can do so. So first of all, there is the stop button. And uh, so this is, we'll see it. And the second is uh, pressing escape. Uh, wait, do, does, does this mean you take, you literally write the word escape in R? I don't think if I got that correctly. Hit the escape key on your keyboard. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, or Control C uh, when you're not using R Studio, and then you can also close the, sh the shiny app window. So let's see that uh, button. Yes. So this is the stop button. So we can either, if we click here, stop, it will stop the app which is running, or we can close that window for um, the escape button. Okay, so that is, I, is there any question before we move to adding the UI controls? There's a note block on the bottom of page five. And if, if, if you're not using the, the uh, textbook, uh, I believe the note is online as well, but it's referring to different browsers. Uh, the comment is saying that, that sometimes Internet Explorer isn't always uh, acceptable of all the various HTML uh, abilities or, or not all browsers are created equally. Let's put it that way. And so I uh, say uh, Internet Explorer uh, has some unique characteristics that uh, do not work with other languages. So the statement says shiny servers strive to, uh, for all modern browsers. Uh, note that Internet Explorer versions prior to IE 11 are not compatible with running Shiny directly from your R session. You can probably run it, and there are some interactions that you can create. What happens on older browsers is the language doesn't support the particular version of WC3, and therefore the, the calls that you're making uh, between the two, the browser just doesn't know how to manage it or how to compile it. So um, there's a web link uh, to a uh, point, and I believe it may list the uh, various supported browsers. I'll see if I can drop that link in. Okay. So to add the UI control, what to do is, I so we, we, I replaced the UI from the simple app that we had created in the first uh, part of this chapter. And uh, so here we have, if we have been introduced for different functions, new functions. So the first function is the fluid page. And this, it does, it's a layout function to set up the visual structure of the page. And we have the select inputs where we have the arguments, data, data sets, we have the label, we have choices. We will learn of this more as, as we proceed more with the book. So this select input, what it does, it's that it's an input control for the user to interact with. Then we have this verbatim text outputs. And uh, uh, so here it has the summary, it has the argument summary and table, uh, sorry. And for the table output, it has the um, argument table. And these two, these two functions, the verbatim text outputs and the table output, they are output controls. So for the verbatim text output, it shows the code results. And um, for the table output, it, it displays the tables. Okay, so these are just ways to generate to generate the HTML. So if we run, um, so if we run this, we run that particular server. We see the app was as follows. No, I have to run the server.
So we have seen that the fluid page, it gives us like the layout, the layout of our structure, our UI structure. Then we have um, the verbatim, it gives us like a textbook with the summary statistics. And then lastly, we have the table, which is as this, it's giving us the data set as it is. Okay. Uh, just a minute, you've been told to run that. <laughs> I didn't read that part. Let's run that and see. Oh. They want us to see this, Ryan, please <laughs> come and help me. Or these are the, yes, these are the data sets actually existing because of the Viva 1, Viva 2. Aha, uh -huh. all right, okay. By running that particular script, or sorry, by running that code block in your console, it is automatically uh, providing you the HTML output of what it would look like as displayed on your browser. So you're you're by making that call directly to the Shiny package and it compiling and 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 spitting back out what it would look like on the browser's end. So you notice you have your div tags surrounding it. Um, and then each uh, option value equals that option value is a is a is a class or a or it's it's part of that drop down menu. So when you were running your uh, service, that drop down menu and then giving you those various lists, that's how it's uh, providing that to your UI directly. The the server is sending that back out, saying these are the selections when you put that input, uh, make that selection, and then it goes back to the server, then it's going to generate out that table. Does that help? Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. So, and then let's open the app in the browser. Oh, okay, I... <laughs> Um, Let's go back then, to your. Please help me. <laughs> yep, you're okay. Let's go back to your R script. Okay. And mm -hmm. let's uh, move your window. Uh, let's let's minimize your console side. There you go. And let's bring that back over. Uh, and we're just gonna. Uh, so right now you have your app dot R. Uh, let's go. That is the right one. So let's just try and run app. Uh, just Control Shift Enter or um, just hit run app at the top right corner there. There we go. So now you're interacting with the service itself, right? And you notice your URL uh, or your path that you're, you're communicating with is that 127.001 on port 6729. Um, if you drop down the data set menu, you'll notice that you have all of your varying data sets. These are all those option values that we were seeing before. So if you select any one of them, um, it's going to refresh that table and then show you not only the uh, R console output, but also try to render that table in the browser for you. Okay. Now this is called a fluid page uh, that the, the next reference it was making uh, in that, uh, where's that at? Second call here. It was talking about what exactly the fluid page was. Uh, I think it was in your notes. There we go. Um, note fluid page is just one option. You also have nav bar page. Uh, there's a sh uh, shiny data set, shiny navigation. There's another, there's another package that you can use as well. Uh, what you're doing is kind of uh, establishing that um, look and feel of your, of your shiny app. Uh, the data itself doesn't change. The information doesn't change by, by modifying the um, call and rendering it differently on your browser. Uh, it gives you a wide array of access to other options. Uh, we'll talk about bootstrapping later on. Uh, but that's ultimately what's going on here. Okay, uh, thank you. I was so lost there. <laughs> thank you for coming to the rescue. Uh, 
Yes, so we have seen the nav bar. This is the example. So I am assuming that you can navigate from the plots. If you click line, you see the line plots. There's a summary and so on. And okay. Lucy, to your benefit, I'll, I'll talk more about this subject in chapter two. Uh, they'll go a little bit further in depth to these various types of options. Um, it won't, I won't even uh, uh, discuss this particular uh, tabbed layout that's going to be uh, later in the chapters, but ultimately the, the point we want to try and convey to our staff or to our team at this moment in time with chapter one is just the fact that we're creating this two-part exchange back and forth between the UI and the server itself. So we have added the UI and then let's add the behavior in and so here in terms of the server. So here we need the server function to bring the outputs to life. And um, so here, this is the analogy we were talking with Ryan. So reactive programming tells Shiny how to perform a function. And as stated by Dr. Hadley, it's that it's the difference between giving someone a recipe versus demanding that they go make you a sandwich. So if I understood correctly from our discussion, it's that this it's like defining and providing a path for Shiny to complete a task uh, instead of like doing the hard coding uh, the instructions. Yes. So in, if you look at this code, we have, we have that this tells Shiny how to fill the summary and to fill the table outputs as we have defined in the UI. So if we run this, we see that, so if we run, uh, let's just look at the code first. So here we see that we have the output summary and this is as, as written in this, the verbatim text output, the summary, and then the table output table. So we see that this is also, it's also the same as the output table, the output dollar table. And here we are rendering a table and here we render a, we render prints like, like the text box with the text box we saw with the summary output for a particular data set. Okay, so once we do that, we see the output is as we see here. So we have, for example, the F deaths uh, data set. We have the minimum, it's 330, and the maximum is 1141. And the data has got only one column named X. So we can navigate and let's say like we choose faithful, where I, if I remember correctly, this was based on eruption of a particular mountain, I think, <laughs> the waiting time and the eruptions, yeah. Um, so you see that it changes that. Uh, so here we have each out ID. So here either the table or the summary is a new shiny output to render where the UI defines it, as you've seen. So there are specific render function. This is the render and the type. So for the different outputs, so we have for the text, table, uh, plot, images, and new UI components. I think we will learn more um, later in the book. So about the reactive reactions. So we have been informed that we need to keep part of, we need to reduce the duplication and to do so, we have to ensure that we use the dry, which is do not repeat yourself. And that is a Wikipedia page, which is as shown, oh my, <laughs> sorry, it is as shown. <laughs> yeah, and um, you can just have a read at, uh, have a read on this link that is provided. So we have been given the, the two disadvantages of using duplicated code. So one of the disadvantage is that usually it is, it bring, it's computationally wasteful and also it increases the dif difficulty of maintaining and debugging of the code when it gets longer, as uh, when it grows, sorry. Um, although here I am, so I will take their word that Although the latest release of Shiny does have some improved debugging tools, we look forward to that. 
Um, so this is a statement that I've added, but in the R traditional scripts, we deal with duplications by either we capture the value using a variable or capturing the computation with a function. This is however not the case in Shiny, and therefore we learn the reactive expressions. So here we can create the reactive expressions by wrapping a block, block of code in the reactive function, this, and assigning it to a variable. Uh, so we can see the diff, we, we can use, you can use the reactive expression like a standard function with one important difference. This is that it runs once and then it caches the results until the input is changed. So once it is initialized, it will return some form of a constant until it is updated again. So if I understood correctly, sorry, yes, Ryan. Oh, I, I apologize. I was just going to jump in and, and kind of define what the reactive concept implies. So the, the, the term caching, what you want to remember is obviously when you start your server and it, it paints the screen or it renders all of the, the code uh, that you've, you've developed in your Shiny app, it will cache any reactive calls. Caching is, is more of an optimal way, static way of just pulling information back out. The idea behind reactive is that it will reset itself if required. So it will pull on cache if it's not required to render again. If anything modifies within that functional call, then it will uh, exchange with the server and pull it back in. And the whole, the whole idea, this is very, very critical at this stage. And I know it's the, the first chapter of the book, but you're gonna see these, these reactive calls over and over again. So I'm hoping to establish the concept of what we're dealing with here in web traffic or in servers. You can have 10,000, 100,000, a million people accessing a server, right? The idea of a caching service means that the server doesn't have to overwork. It's already rendered this plot so that the next user that, that accesses, you know, uh, it, it already uh, has it stored on your computer. Um, this isn't the same as cookies. Don't get involved there. Uh, caching is, is like temp files. Uh, you've already accessed that server before um, to optimize or to make the call faster. Um, it will access that cached media. If that cached media is stale, old, or needs to be updated, then it will reset and make that reactive call back to the server to update itself. So the idea of reactivity is, is nothing more than the, the, the nature of this caching process versus do I need to make a more expensive call to the server and then burn up some web traffic to download more media to my browser, if that helps. So if we look before this particular section, we haven't uh, mentioned anything to do with, we, have, we don't see the reactive function that you have learned just now. But if you look at this particular code where, so we have, we have to assign a variable. So here we have, uh, sorry, an object name. So we have a data set and then we want to, um, so reactive and then whatever that we enclose this, <laughs> chunk of code yeah, and the reactive. And then we do the same. Um, okay, so then the output, whatever that is um, used inside is the reactive expression we created above. And similar for, similar for the table where we have, okay, so here for the table, we'll just call the dataset function. Okay. Um, so if we run the app, so let's run the server. Then we, yes, we run the app. So I, I think it's, yes, it's still what you had seen. The difference is now what Ren was explaining, the caching of, um, so we have run one, the, the data set will be run once. Yeah, instead of twice. Okay. Uh in, in, the re, in the relationship of using this reactive, and uh, I'll show some debugging later on, there's a whole chapter dedicated to this concept of uh, the reactive table and being able to see exactly what is happening on the, the UI end. But in relation to what you're showing as a running app, browser side running app, when you are making that selection, so it's 
pulling the static data that you've already rendered from the server. If you do this multiple times, it's good. It's just going to pull on that cache media because you've already uh, incurred the cost of, of downloading it to your browser, right? Or in this little temporary space, this cached area. When you change to a different data set, obviously you don't have that media. So the reactive call resets, it goes to the server and then downloads it again. Again, it's a more efficient way of, of managing web traffic uh, by, by making these reactive wrappers. Hi, Ren, please allow me to ask a question. So yeah, here, ahead. when we're doing this, this the first uh, chunk of the server here, we mm -hmm. are repeating because we have the data set and we have, we have another data set here where we are. So it's, we are repeating ourselves. But then if you look at this other, it's we create this uh, data set. And then so using this reactive, it's like the results are created like a temporary file, as you've said. And, and then this um, that file is then used in the creating of the summary and um, showing of the data set as a table. Take it correctly. OK. Uh, uh, instead of going to the moon to mine gold and flying all the way back to Earth, um, you already have uh, some warehouse of media that you can access instead to do whatever process you're building, whatever the case may be. Um, and it's at the point when you need to go incur that cost to go fly back to the moon again uh, to get more raw materials. That's the concept of this, this reactive concept. In the first code chunk above, if we were to analyze that nature, you're flying to the moon back and forth, right? Okay, well, it's fairly efficient. Your computer's you know, fairly uh, fast and, and, and you're just running locally to your, to your own uh, loopback um, machine. If this were a true form networking type concept and the, that server is on the other side of the, the planet somewhere um, and that web traffic to go back and forth, it's very inefficient. It costs a lot of time and effort uh, relying on the network to uh, make those uh, data set calls. By going into that reactive mode, now you're caching, you're warehousing, you're putting that, that content close to your machine so that um, it's going to be more efficient at, at pulling up uh, or rendering that output. Uh, you don't have to go out to the server again. Again, we'll, we'll talk about the, the reactive table, being able to access that and, and actually watch the statement calls as the uh, browser, as you're interacting with your browser. I cannot wait for that chapter. <laughs> so many things will make sense. Uh, okay, so this is, um, I think this is an ad additional just section based on code two. So I will try explain what I understood. <laughs> yeah, uh, but please feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. So here we have so let's visualize what you have done in the previous section. So we, we have the user input, the UI, where we have uh, um, the fluid page and so on. Then we have uh, this trapezium shape. I'm poor in colors, so let me use shapes. Yeah, reactive. So uh, so here we do, we do the reactive expression like what Rena just explained. And then lastly, now we have the outputs. So the output will change if we input different uh, things in the UI. So and then we have the reactive, exp the reactive uh, expression happening. <laughs> and then now the output changes. Okay. Um, so this is the example where we have the input functions. And then we have the expression having the reactive and this is the server. And then it renders to it also after that we have the render of let's say here we had the verba team and the is it no <laughs> uh, yes the render prints and um render table yeah and then lastly we have the output so either here in summer based on the id that we put in the inputs so we have output summary or the output table and then um, 
Ren, please jump in and help me. I I, I feel I'm so lost. I'm, I'm oh, trying no, to make you're, sense. Yes. It's it, this is perfectly okay, and 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 it's very good to uh, to ask that. The again, the idea that here is is this caching mechanism, right? So if we're looking at the second uh, exchange, you have your UI and you have your server, just two different uh, uh, mechanisms that the shiny service is providing us. The UI would be your browser and the server would be your machine, right? The CPU or the, this, this uh, web socket, web server that you're creating. Your input function where I have that drop down menu of different data sets. So I, I, I drop down and I select a different data set to render that. The logic of your browser says, do I have that in a cached media, right? We're using reactive calls here. So do I have that? that cached media that I can, I can pull in based on that input ID number or I, I, I input ID, it's an arbitrary value. So do I have it? Yes or no? No, I do not. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna incur that cost and go to the server to, to pull it down, okay? The point of this uh, uh, logic, I guess, this reactive expression logic is that choice of pulling it from my cached media or calling it to the server. In the case that we don't have this currently, then I have to ask the server to provide it to me. The server populates that reactive call with the information to render on the browser or the UI side. Okay. So that's where your, your arrows are flowing here is from the right, uh, from the left-hand side UI input function, uh, input ID. Then it goes to the expression reactive. Reactive goes to render type expression. Then you go to your output ID and then it populates the receiving object that you have on your UI to accept that information. The point, Lucy, or, or what this image, this figure is trying to replicate or represent is in your UI, you will always have inputs. You, can have outputs too, but um, primarily it'll be inputs. And then on your server side, it'll be satisfying those labels or satisfying those uh, input IDs uh, that you're you're creating. If you don't mind, do you wanna go back to R real quick and I'll kind of give a brief summary of what we're talking there. So uh, uh, just scroll up a bit because we wanna see the UI side. So we create the fluid page. Obviously that's a container that's just think of that as your, your browser, this language that we're creating. We have a select input. Notice that the term input is key here. We're calling that data set. So the, the input ID that we're providing to it is called data set, but that can be of any arbitrary value that we wanna provide. The label, the label is what you're going to see in text above that input uh, box. Okay. The next one is the verbatim text output, and that is the uh, shadowed area when the app is running. That's our verbatim text output, and we're labeling that as summary. And then the final is the table output, and that's the bottom of your page where we're using um, a beautifying, I guess, uh, a type of HTML output to, to generate that table. Now, what we're dealing with in complement, this is, this is the key between the UI and the server side. So we have a select input called data set, the, the ID, input ID is, is data set. If you notice below where we are populating that, the data set variable get its input dollar sign data set, those two label IDs match. And that's the, that's the critical point here is that those two must equal each other for the, the, the language of Shiny to operate. If you're, if you're creating this, this placeholder, this object saying, I'm looking for information, the server is going to have a complementary label I, uh, input ID or, or uh, output ID that you're selecting to send that information and, and, and render it on the screen. Does that help, Lucy? Yes, yes, I understand. Thank Perfect. You. Perfect. Okay, so in, in summary, it's what has been shown here. Um, please focus the slides in your own uh, local machine. Sorry, yes. <laughs> and uh, follow along and you'll be able to see these illustrations. So for the shiny, this is the shiny resources. So first of all, there's the cheat sheet. Yeah, it has, uh, yeah, it's a cheat sheet. 
and the other resources, that is the Shiny Gallery. So here there is a lot of inspiration and demos of specific UI components and server behaviors. It's the link to the Shiny Widgets Gallery. And um, this, it, it is included in this link above and it introduces the main options for the inputs in the UI. And lastly, the Shiny Dashboard, which is a nice framework for creating good looking codes, sorry, good looking and well-structured apps with minimal efforts. Um, you can have a look at this link for your reference. Um, yeah, so this is it for today. So for next week, which is the basic UI, we have, if I'm not wrong, we have Brian to take us through. I was going to look at the GitHub page real quick for this, uh, or for DS Mastering Shiny. I'm curious on chapter one, if it's Collins Media that we're using from cohort two, or if this was Russ Hyde's media that we're using from cohort one. I'm making a distinction between the two users of that version of or that that particular time of cohort. Um, if it's Russ Hyde's version, Russ may have jumped ahead in satisfying the concepts of this reactive call at an early stage of learning. Um, I don't believe Colin went this degree, so that's why I'm if I'm recalling when Colin was giving chapter one, uh, it would have been August of last year. I don't believe, I, I don't recognize these images. That's why I'm thinking it may have been Russ's. Either way, if you do fork this, if you do uh, keep it local and, and render it, all of the applications are there. What I want to um, express to the group is this will make sense, I promise you. It looks foreign right now. It looks a little bit weird on how it's creating this handshake between the two. Um, these figures are not in your textbook or in chapter one of, of the Mastering Shiny uh, online textbook. Uh, so they are looking foreign. What I want to promise you is chapter three and beyond, we will start to access this reactive table where you will see this generated in real time, literally the same object uh, with color codes. As you interact with your browser, you'll see this other console where uh, it, it will reset, change, uh, satisfy the object ID, and you can use it as a debugging tool. Uh, it's very, very, very helpful. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for your contribution in the discussion. It was really helpful. And I, I look forward to really understanding this. <laughs> like I mentioned, I created some of uh, some few apps, but I, I don't think if I really understood what is going on, like what is really, really going on. So this is the opportunity that I have to now understand. I, we have a new member, um, Oyedele. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, welcome. Uh, feel, you can, feel free to introduce yourself. I am Njoki or Lucy, it helps. Yeah, I'm the facilitator for this particular cohort and we have just completed uh, chapter one. So we look forward to starting chapter two next week, same time. Yeah, please do introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Oluwa Femi Uyedele. I am a research fellow here at ITA. I think last week I watched uh, the I, I was unable to join the cohort one, but I think I have gone through what are there with discussion in cohort one. So preparing myself uh, for today, though today I, it's, I'm so sorry that I joined uh, late, but by next week I'll keep uh, to time. And I've been using R, I am a self-taught uh, programmer, but I still really want to really go deeper into like shiny app, um, taking myself into another level in program. Thank you very much. Awesome. You are at home. You are in the right place. <laughs> yeah, I, so we, we already met. I, I think Ryan and Brendan, you can introduce yourself to him since he'll be part of the cohorts. So, yeah. <laughs> sure, I can go. Um, so it's nice to meet you. My name is Brendan. I'm currently in Toronto, Canada, where I'm working as a research assistant at a children's hospital. Um, and so I do research 
and acquired brain injury in psychology and neuroscience. And so also largely a self-taught art programmer. Um, and yeah, looking to also um, learn how to build um, more sophisticated shiny apps. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm uh, a training manager, uh, instructional designer slash uh, uh, aspiring data analytics, uh, R Studio user, et cetera. Um, similar to what Brendan had said, uh, most of my R experience is self-taught. Uh, we used it in grad school. And so I'm hoping to complement all of that previous uh, instruction. Uh, I, I have to smile during that grad studies. You understand the concepts of what you're doing, but you don't have any idea of what the code is doing. So now it's the, that opportunity to go back and reflect on uh, scripts that I wrote during that period of time of I'm just looking at a forum post, pasting some stuff in there and hopefully making it work, uh, wrangling with uh, uh, error messages that, that crop up. But uh, in relation to Shiny specifically or web development in, in general, um, I am a senior tech writer. I do very much a lot of web generated output. So HTML and or uh, different forms of rendering, Pandoc, Markdown, R Markdown, et cetera. So all of this is extremely familiar and it helps to reinforce the concepts of how Shiny and RStudio language, their, their vernacular, the, the, the terms that they use as it is applied to the more common web HTML development front end, back end type language. So that transposing between the two is very helpful. And I hope to, uh, I hope to satisfy or compliment Lucy in her, in her uh, quest of, of managing the cohort or, or facilitating the cohort, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Ren and Brendan for introducing yourself. I, so we have, we are set that Ren will um, carry out the discussion for next week. So we have, um, or you did, if you look at the pinned, uh, the pinned things, yes, on the Slack channel, you'll see our cohort three sign up sheets. So feel free to sign up uh, for a chapter. You, you trust me, I didn't do most of this stuff. I was talking. <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I carried out the discussion. So that is all that matters because in the process you understand quite a lot in like what I've, what I've done today. Yeah, I, if there's nothing else, I, I think we can stop here and meet next week, same time, same day. I love oh, yes. to uh, reinforce or drop that into the into the chat. Uh, so what what will happen uh, when we're in the Zoom session? Uh, anything that we put into the chat will be pasted into our cohort three. Uh, mastering shiny message thread in Slack. Uh, so they're complementing each other. By posting anything here, it will show up in Slack uh, within a, a day or two, uh, depending on how long it take for, uh, takes us to render the video and render the chat, post it back into Slack. So for long-term use, uh, it's always helpful to drop things in your Zoom meeting. Um, if, if you miss out, you can put it in Slack as well. Uh, it's just not... Uh, containerized, it's not local to the actual date of activity when the cohort was going on or when the presentation was going on. Awesome, uh, thank you. So I, I, I really want to leave, I've had a very long day and I want to go rest. So have yourself a good day, good yeah, afternoon, I just and good morning. Want to, just a quick. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. I want to ask, is it composite? Is it, I can, can I sign for more than one talk or, or just pick a specific chapter? And no, uh, you Oh, can... I must sign for only one chapter. Not really, since, no, I, I particularly signed for one, but you can sign for as many <laughs> as you feel comfortable okay. uh, discussing, yeah. Uh, but if, if you not be able to carry out the discussion for that uh, in a space, in a, the day that you had registered, you can just let us know in advance and then Ryan or I will carry out the discussion. For that particular okay. chapter yeah okay thank you okay all right uh bye everyone i will see you
Uh, see you next week. See ya.